Okay, meet you. I'm gonna just give me a few minutes. We're just uh, finishing the setup and letting some people join the, the classroom. We're just sending out a couple more messages and then we're going to get started. All right, can um, somebody send me a text in the chat room just to make sure you can hear me good? And we're going to get started in a couple of, in a minute. I just wanted to send out a couple of messages right quick. But you need to log in in order to uh, send a message in the chat. Okay, Major was so. So you, you can hear me good? That's good. That's cool. All right, we're going to send one. I'm going to send out one more message and then we'll be straight. Just want to send this message out to Facebook right quick and we'll be done. All right. Okay, let me see. All right. Michi Amo, Eneye, Akanfo, Nanasom, Da, Medinde, Ojirafo, Kwesi, Ra, Nehembata, Khan. Akwamu Maina Maruka Etifi Mu Ojirafo, that means today is Akanfo Nanason Day, Ancient Authentic Akan Ancestral Religion. I'm Ojirafo Kwesi Radnehem Pata Akan, the Ojirafo of the Akwamu Nation in North America, Akwamu Maina Maruka Etifi Mu. Uh, what we're doing in this session is we're going to talk about the Abosom Obuadie, who was called Pata in ancient Kemet and Kanit. Um, this is part of the series of us dealing with the creative Abosom. Um, at first we dealt with the, the different sessions that we've had. The first three were Nanasom Ne Amamre, parts one, two, and three. So the first one we dealt with cosmology and we talked about the Kra, the Okra, and the Okrawa, the Khan, and Kayet in relationship to our, the cosmological structure of creation. Uh, the next piece we dealt with uh, was dealing with the Nananom and Samanfo, which are the ancestresses and ancestors and their function 
in our lives and in the cosmological order. Then the next piece was dealing with the albosome, which are the spirit forces in creation that animate the sun, moon, stars, oceans, rivers, and so forth, planets. And we dealt with their, the nature and function of them with respect to the cosmic order and with respect to us as Afurakani, Afurakani people. Then we did a whole series on the Akradin boson, which is the boson that govern the solar, lunar, and planetary bodies, which uh, govern the Akan seven-day week. So we went through that whole series. Um, we dealt with all 11 of those Abosom. And then we also dealt with Asase Afua and Asase Ya, which are two Earth Mother Abosom. Um, okay, I just wanted to check. I thought I saw something pop up. Then we went to, um, we started talking about the creative Abosom. So we talked about Nyonkompon and Nyonkompon, who is Ra and Raet. Uh, we talked about Odomankoma, who is Atim, or Atim Kepra in ancient Kemet, um, Odomankoma and Akan, and then we also talked about Tredrian Pong, who is also, that's Kepra in ancient Kemet, so Odomankoma is Atim, um, also called Atim Kepra, Atim Mukopa in Akan, um, Odomankoma, Kepra is also called Tredrian Pong in Akan, and this is of course Kepra, or uh, Kepra, in ancient Kemet. So we're, we're dealing with these creative abosom and the last major creative abosom we're, we're going to deal with is Obuadie, who is Pata in ancient Kemet. Now the reason why we're dealing with these creative powers in this fashion is because typically when you're reading about, and we talked about this before, when you're reading about Akan ancestral religion or even just Afro-Akani, afro ancestral religion in general, Often what they're doing is they're, they're saying that they're, we're monotheistic, which is totally in, inaccurate. There are people teaching ancestral religion, whether it's dealing with the Yoruba tradition, Akan, Vodun, um, ancient Kemet, ancient Kanit or Nubia, um, Guramanchi tradition, the Bambara tradition, the Dogon tradition, uh, the Zulu tradition, whatever it is, they're misrepresenting the tradition talking about we're monotheistic, which is totally inaccurate. There's a great god, there's a great goddess, they function together as a unit, two individual entities that function together harmoniously, that complement one another, and they give birth to the various gods and goddesses, the various abosom, the various orisha, the various vodou, the various arusi, the various Ntoru, Ntorutu, the various deities, the gods and goddesses, and there are many of them. So that notion of monotheism is foolishness. That is just an infection of white culture, and some people are so enamored with white culture and they fear the whites and their offspring that they attempt to graft the foolishness of the whites and their offspring into our culture because they still believe our culture is primitive. And deep down inside, it's a basic fear of the whites and their offspring. They don't want to offend the whites in their offspring. A lot of them want money from the whites, the whites in their offspring, as well, well as Negroes who are still associated with Christianity and so forth. They become apologists for their own tradition. They don't want to talk the truth about Christianity and Islam and Hebrewism and Judaism, uh, Brahmanism, uh, Hinduism, Vedanta, Buddhism, Taoism, all the pseudo um, metaphysics, Kabbalism, Hermeticism. Uh, all these foolish doctrines. They don't want to tell the truth that these, the characters that comprise these doctrines are all fictional characters who never existed. There's no spirituality in any of these doctrines. They don't want to tell the truth about that because they will lose revenue and they will lose a following. And many of them just fear the whites and their offspring, so they continue to teach lies about the culture. Some of them is deliberate. Some of them are just so brainwashed or so controlled by the fear of the fallout of telling the truth, that they're, they're just too fearful. So we have to talk about the truth about the culture. Now, um, we're dealing with the Akan tradition, and it's the same across the board. People will falsely assert that Nyame is the great god, which is true, but there is no great goddess. And then the various abosom, creative abosom, major abosom, who are actually subordinate to Nyame and Nyamewa, and servants of Nyamewa and Nyame, they will say that these abosom don't exist. They're actually just names or titles of the great father, the great supreme being, male. So 
very often they say that about Nyonkum Pong, they say that about Odomankuma, they say that about Tredrian Pong, and they say it about Obuadie as well. It's totally inaccurate. Those Akan or Ghanaian academics as well as others, as well as the people who have been initiated into priests and priestesshoods, received bogus initiations or initiations from people on the continent who were just as infected with Islam and Christianity and white culture and have been infected for decades, some of them for centuries, they have passed on an infection, an intergenerational infection, and then when they initiate people from America who don't know any better, we just go over there and get initiated and become enamored with the culture or somebody comes here, we get enamored with their accent and their traditional practices and rituals we've never seen before and we just run with it. And when they teach us things that are inaccurate and our Akra, Akrawa says, no, that's foolishness, we're not confident enough in our own um, Akra, which is our divine consciousness, as well as our own Nsamanfo because we've been conditioned to believe that our Nsamanfo are not intelligent and can't teach us anything about the culture. So we just go along with what the infected so-called elders and eldresses from the continent are teaching us even though it's inaccurate. So some of these initiated Okonfo priests and priestesses, Obosomfo, um, Suma and Brafo as well, they teach misinformation. And they will continue to teach that Obuade is just a name of Inyame, um, Bore Bore is just a name of Inyame, Nyokumon is just a name of Inyame, and so forth. So this last creative Abosom we're gonna deal with in this series is Obuade to show that he is an abosom, a force in nature that is a servant of Inyame, um, subordinate to Inyame and Inyamewa, as well as subordinate to Nyokumpon and Nyokumpon, subordinate to Ra and Raya. So um, first, were there any other, uh, any questions from the previous session? Do you have any, or previous sessions? Um, if you have any questions, just um, type them in the chat. Again, you have to be logged in in order to uh, submit questions or communicate via the chat. And you can log in, sign up very quickly if you're not a member, it's very similar to just signing up for a free email account. It just takes a couple of minutes. All right, so we're going to deal with Bata. So, Obuade in Akan, first, etymologically, the word Ba means to create or to make or to fashion or to form and so forth. There are a number of different um, definitions, but they re the major definitions revolve around that kind of activity. And then Adie means Ade or Adie means a thing or an object, a deed or an entity. Now in, in the wider scope, Adie can mean the thing, meaning the universe. So obo adie or obo adie is the fashioner of the thing or the fashioner of the universe. Now, it also um, deal on the individual level. It can also mean a thing as in an action. So if someone says wo adie pa, which means you have done a good thing, adie, the, the thing that you did is the is the adie, the thing, the event the action. But we're talking about the adie, the great adie or the great thing. Bo adie is the fashioner of the thing, the fashioner of the universe. The reason why he has that title in Akan, this Abosong, because he's the fashioner of the universe or the excavator of the universe, Bo adie is sometimes double Bo adie, Bo adie or Bo adie, Bo adie, which means the, ex the fashioner, the architect, the excavator of the universe. Um, this goes back directly to his origins in ancient Kanit, Nubia, and ancient Kemet. Just like Ba means to fashion or to form or to make, Po in ancient Kemet and Kanit means to make or to mold. Uh, ta means, it can mean a number of different things. Ta is related to the term for land like a flat plain the original um, land that was fashioned, the inert land before the first hill rose up, the flat land, the ta. Uh, ta can also mean fire. Uh, ta can also mean immersion 
um, buried deep within, submerged, and then uh, ta also means lead, which is a form of, of course, meta. Pata is the, cons and then, then the word pata, so those are the components, po, to form or to make or to fashion. Pata is also a term meaning, in general, to fashion, to engrave, to sculpt, and so forth. Um, pata is seen as the master craftsman, uh, the patron ntoro, or patron divinity of crafts craftsmen, artists, metal workers, fashioners, sculptors, and so forth. This is because Pata is the great abosom that operates through the innermost core of the earth, the innermost core of the sun, planets, suns, stars. He's the inner core, that fire at the inner core. He is called the great fashioner, Pata, the great fashioner of the universe, the great excavator of the universe, the great architect of the universe. He fashions the suns, fashions the planets, fashions the um, stars, fashions the atmospheres, fashions our bodies, fashions the bodies of plant life, animal life, mineral life, and afurakani afurakani human life. He also fashions our spirits and fashions our bodies as well. So that's, that's the key um, definition for his functioning. Now we have to deal with the, with the cosmology that we've talked about in the past just so you can get an idea of how Pata fits into the overall cosmology. Before we go forward, any, any questions on that so far? Okay, so we, when we talk about the origin of the universe, we talked about Amen and Aminet, the great father and the great mother. Amen, of course, in our kind is called Nyame or Nyame, the great father, and Amenet or Amenat is Nyamewa in our kind, the great mother. So, Amen and Amenet, the root uh, Amen means hidden, but it also means stable, permanent, and abiding. So, as the great being, Amen and Amenet, two individuals who function together as one unit, complementary halves of a whole, male and female. They're the great divine being, the invisible or hidden being, but they're also stable, permanent, and abiding. So just like you, have, you can have a male and a female, an Afurakani male, Afurakani female, a male and female being, and then within the being, your being is hidden, you can't see your being, you can't see your spirit, but you're a, you're a hidden, quote unquote, invisible spirit, but you do have being. Inside your body, you have your ka, kaet, the black substance of space manifests as the ka and kaet. That is the formless, dark energy, a dark matter that contains all of the stars, all of the suns, all of the planets. Everything in the universe is contained within that black substance. That is the black body of amen and amenet. And inside of our bodies is miniature amen and amenet we have that black substance that we call abatum in our con, uh, melanin, kanu or katnut is a term that we use, uh, soul energy, um, that's the black substance, the melanin that saturates your entire being and all of your organs and systems exist within that black substance. And its apex, it's all throughout your being, but its apex is in the brain, in the neural melanin. Just like a pyramid, a, a mer has it's, it's a full body structure, but it has an apex. And it's the same thing with your melanin structure, your abatum structure, the black substance that's in your body, um, that, that's the substance, that's the ka, the kayak, but its apex is inside the head, inside the neural melanin. So you are amen and amenet, the male and the female, and inside your body, you have that black substance which carries and all the organs and organ systems dwell within that black substance and are actually formed in the beginning as a zygote from that black substance. So that's Amen, Amenet, that's Ka and Kayet, the great black substance of space, which are two entities that were birthed by Amen and Amenet as expansive um, abosome that have the capacity to create uh, intelligence, um, utilize intelligence consciousness, create ideas, and so forth. That's the divine consciousness of Amen and Amenet. The black substance of space 
is where they dwell and they manifest physically as a black substance of space. So just like you as an invisible spirit, when you lay down to sleep at night in the dark, you can employ your mind, employ your consciousness and direct it to fashion images out of blackness, out of nothingness. You can fashion any kind of image you want, any kind of color, any fo um, combination of geometric forms. You can fashion that. You can direct your consciousness not to do it, or you can di direct your consciousness to do that. You can employ your consciousness, you can employ your ka, your kayak, to fashion colorful forms. Just the reason you can do that is because Amen and Amenet in the beginning gave birth to Ka and Kayet and direct them to fashion forms within their black substance. And eventually those forms would be given life and become the planets, the suns, the moons, and stars, and so forth. Now once that black substance was fashioned, those two entities, Ka and Kayet, then Amen and Amenet, because they wanted to create the universe, had to give that black substance the capacity to expand and contract and create movement or expansion and contraction. They gave birth, therefore, to the abosom hehu and hehut, the abosom of boundlessness, eternity, expansion, and contraction, the breathing process. So just like you have your being, your body, you have the black substance within you, then you begin to expand and contract, you begin to breathe and now you're active. Now the expansion and contraction process happening in the black substance of space, just like we said before, if you have a pot of uh, water, that, that formless um, liquid mass is like the black substance of space. When it's, there's an expansion and contraction going on, when you turn the heat up and the heat starts moving inside of the water, there's an expansion and contraction. That's the hehu and the hehu, the breathing process. And that breathing process causes waves to develop. And those waves begin to ripple and it, their rapidity increases. The rippling effect, when you, have, when you start breathing, that starts to generate heat. Same thing within your body, the same thing that happened in the universe. So the expansion and contraction started to generate heat and create a rippling effect. And that rippling effect was the birth in the cosmos of new or nanu and Nanut, sometimes called Nun and Nunet. And their Medutu, their hieroglyphics, are written with the wavy line. They're the energy, the primordial, um, primordial energy, male and female, in the black substance. So when that expansion and contraction of Hehu and Hehu in the blackness began to happen, then the birth of the waves, the wave energy that has the capacity to move energy from one space to another because the waves are moving, that's the birth of new and Nut, or Nun and Nunet. And then when they unite under the direction of Amen and Amenet, then they give birth to spiraling energy, just like the water that's boiling, once it becomes so rapid that it's no longer just creating waves, but it begins to generate spheres or bubbles. The same thing happened in the black substance of space, when Hehu and Hehut began to breathe, expand and contract, then the ripples began to develop. That was the birth of Nu and Nut, Nun and Nunet. They were able to carry that energy back and forth within the black substance, and they united and gave birth to radiant energy, radiant forms, which would burst forth as the first light, fire, and heat in the universe, and that's Ra and Rayat. And they burst forth just like the bubbles rising up out of the water that previously was still but once that breathing process began, and then the breathing process created heat, then the heat caused the waving, and then the un union of the, the waves gave birth to the spheres, and the spheres rose up out of that form formless uh, matter. That's Ra and Rayat rising up out of the black substance of space and exploding into the fire and light of um, the first aspect of creation that separates the darkness. Now, you have Ra and Rayat, the fire, the spirits animating the fire and light of creation that separates and pierces the darkness, a radiant energy moving through the darkness, a spiraling radiant energy creating spiraling forms, creating black spheres. Now remember in physics, suns, stars are called 
black bodies because of their structure. So Ra and Ra'ed are creating these black spheres. Now I'm in and I'm in that direct Pata as well as Sekhmet, the wife of Pata, or um, Pata, the husband of Sekhmet, because they're balanced, they're equal um, and complementary. They direct Pata to fashion these spheres and fashion what takes place within these spheres. So Ra and Ra'et are the divine living energy that gives life to everything. Without Ra and Ra'et, there is no life. But once you have a divine living energy coursing through things, you have to fashion those things into specific forms. Pata's uh, function in creation is to fashion specific forms. Now, just like you, or just in the world, you can take energy and when you fashion it into specific forms, then it can execute certain objectives. So you can use electricity, electromagnetic energy, but if you create an apparatus like um, a laser a machine that creates uh, lasers, like when people are using um, laser surgery for um, eye surgery, now you've taken electromagnetic energy and you've fashioned it into a specific form, a laser beam, and now it can execute a specific objective. And it's the same thing, that's the same thing that Pata does. He takes the divine living energy of Ra and Ra'et and fashions it into specific forms to execute specific objectives. The objectives come from Inyamewa and Inyame, or Amen and um, Amenet and Amen. So when they want planets to form in a certain manner, they direct Pata to fashion the planets in a certain manner. Direct Pata places Pata at the center or the core, the innermost core of the sun, the innermost core of planets, suns, stars, and so forth. And through that interactive process of Pata and Sekhmet at the core, then they create heat expansion and contraction. Um, heat and cooling are the dynamics of form. So emanating and radiating from the center, they begin to fashion or develop uh, the planet Earth. So when you look at the planet Earth, for example, the innermost core around 9,000 degrees Fahrenheit, that's the spirit of Pataz at the inner core of the planet. And his movements expanding and contracting and fashioning and forming is what shapes the Earth ultimately. Of course, the Earth has a, you know, a magnetosphere, is, a, is affected by the sun and so forth, but the movements on the inside of Earth are shaping what's happening um, on the surface of Earth, as well as the atmosphere, interacting with the atmosphere. So Pata is at the center of Earth. In our bodies, he's operating through the brain and also in connection with Sekhmet, operating through the bone marrow, the fire in the marrow of the bones. And their union in those areas are generating form for us. Even when we're from the very beginning as, as a zygote and we're just a cell with a nucleus, Pata's spirit energy is fashioning our forms according to the dictates of Inyamewa Inyame. Okay, so any any questions so far on that? Okay, I see one question. Brother asked, um, are Gullah and Geechee people Akan? They are the Gullah and Geechee people, there are different groups within the Gullah and Geechee nation. So um, there are of course, people from Angola, where Gullah comes from. Um, there are people who are Bakongo. There are people who are Igbo. You know about, you probably heard about Igbo landing. If you watch like Daughters of the Dust, they talk about the Igbo connection there. Yoruba, Bakongo, Igbo. There would be some Akan there as well. It seems from what the things that we've learned about, studied, and communicated with people about, it was more. Akan were like a minority in the Gullah Geechee Nation, but of course there were some Akan there, there were some Mindy speaking people there as well. But Khan, it seems to be that the Akan were a minority, but that's, some, that's a field, and you know, that's, that's a direction that people can research and get some more information on. We still have a lot to uncover. But what, what we've seen, is it, it, it appears that um, it was more so the people um, central Afuraka, Afuraikai, um, Central East, well, Central and West Afuraka, Afuraikai. So it was more so um, 
Gala Mbundu, like Ovin, Ovin Bundu, um, Ovambo, and Kikongo, and other groups in that closer to that region, as well as the Igbo and, and, and Yoruba people. Okay. All right, so Pataz the fashioner. So we went through the whole piece of how he comes into being, he begins to fashion. So, so you have to have something within your being. If you're going to have forms, you, of course you have to have a divine living energy that animates all created entities. That's Ra and Ra'et. Then you have to have um, a force in nature that can take that energy and fashion it into specific forms to execute your specific objectives. So just like your thoughts, Ptah forms your, our bodies, he forms the planets, suns, um, and the bodies of plants, animals, um, minerals, and Afurakani, Afurakani humans. And then within our bodies, he also fashions our spirits operating through our brain. He fashions our thought forms. So you can fashion your thought forms. You have the capacity, just like your, your brain has the capacity to fashion your the energy moving through your body into muscular energy so that you can get up and walk and move and jump and so forth you have the capacity to take the life force energy moving through you and fashion it into uh, specific units that are capable of fashioning thoughts into energy matrices energetic matrices that will compel you to operate in a certain fashion execute a certain function engage in certain behaviors just like somebody can take energy through an apparatus, turn it into a laser beam, and utilize that specific form of energy for a specific purpose, you can fashion certain thoughts, take the energy that's moving through you, the Ra and Ra energy moving through you, you can direct your Ka to fashion that energy into a certain unit, a component of energy that's capable of influencing your thoughts into a form, into an energy matrix that now compels you, just like a planet has an orbit and it is an, it's electromagnetic, it has a gravitational pull. Once you fashion something and the energy is moving through that, that sphere, now it creates its own gravitational pull. So if you fashion thoughts in a certain form, you direct your car, just like when you're sleeping, you can, or laying in a dark room, you can direct your car to fashion thoughts, ideas, images, and so forth. Just like Amen and Amen that created the Ka and Kayat, and within that blackness, um, images, forms, and so forth were fashioned. And then Ra and Rayat gave life to those images, and Pata fashioned the black substance of space to make it exactly according to the image that Amen and Amen that um, first gave forth, you know, first brought forth. You can take the energy that's surging through you and fashion it into a specific um, units of power that will influence and shape your thoughts into energetic matrices. And your thoughts and your ideas now will be potent energetic matrices with their own gravitational pull that affects your compulsion. You will have the compulsion now and you will be impelled and compelled to operate in a specific fashion, execute certain behaviors, and also repel other behaviors and repel other ideas. When you're in alignment with Pata, the divine fashioner, he only fashions things that are in harmony with divine order, including your thought processes. If you're out of alignment with Pata, then you will fashion certain thought forms that become powerful because there's energy moving through the forms, creating a magnetic pull, creating an orbit, and then you're drawn into that orbit and then you move in a certain direction that's self-destructive. So Patad, not only does he fashion the world, fashion our bodies in the womb, fashion the earth and so forth, but he also, operating through our brain, um, fashions our thoughts, intentions, and actions if we align with him. And he operates through the brain, which is the seat, as we said before, of the Ka and the Kayat, or the Akra, and the Okrawa. He's the great fashioner and sometimes he has the title Ka because he executes the function of the Ka on earth just like the black substance of space is the great Ka, the great Kayat. He functions as a Ka in the world. Alright? 
Okay. So, so that's the cosmological aspect. Now there is a specific uh, text, and we posted it on the um, on the Facebook page. It's a text called the Shabaka. Well, it's on the Shabaka stone. So the pair of Shabaka, who uh, was one of the so-called, um, well, the Kanit, one of the Kanit kings, one of the Kanit pair of one of the Kanit pharaohs, Nubian kings. Um, he found it was, the specific stone was found during his reign, and he saw that it was an ancient text. It was kind of uh, damaged, so he had the text re reestablished, rewritten. On a, on a specific stone, it was found somewhere um, by one of his one of his followers, one of his uh, functionaries. They di he directed them to restore the text and then carve it in stone. And this particular text, it talked about the death and resurrection, a certain aspect of the story of Osiris, Set, and Heru. It talked about um, when Heru and Set were fighting, and Geb uh, ruled that. You know, Heru would be over the northern portion, lower Kemet, and then Set would be over <coughs> upper Kemet. And then after a period, he decided to give the entire inheritance to Heru. So that was part of the first part of the text. It talked about the resurrection of Osar and um, Heru and Nebuchadnezzar and Al Set facilitating that process. That's in the text. But then there's a major part of the text talking about the nature and function of Ptah. And of course that's Obuade in Akan. And before we say that, just understand, and this is in the text as well, Ptah in Kemet, Obuade in Akan, he is called the Orisha Obaluae in the Yoruba tradition, Babaluae, Obaluae, uh, the first king of earth, Oba means king and Aye means earth. Um, He's called Sakpata, one of the Sakpata twins in Vodun, in Fon and Eve. Um, the Sakpata twins are called um, Dazoji and Nyokwe Ananu. Um, he's Dazoji, so he's also called the first king of earth in Vodun, the first king of earth in Yoruba tradition. Of course, in Kemet, he's the first king of earth because he's placed at the innermost core of earth. He begins the fashioning process in the papyri or the papyrus of what they call Turin when they talk about the king's list and they talk about the first Abosom who ruled in ancient Kemet. There was a dynasty of Abosom, then a dynasty of the followers of Heru and, and dynasty of ancestral spirits um, for thousands of years and then later on they talk about the true historical dynasties beginning of human beings beginning with Mena going back like 6,000 years ago, but the a whole text is talking about a, a span of over 40,000 years. They say the first king um, of the, when the Abosom were ruling Kemet from the world, the first king of earth was Ptah. So in ancient Kemet, Ptah is the king of earth, the first king of earth. In Yoruba, Obaluae, in Vodun, um, Dazoji or one of the Sakpata twins. Sometimes they just call him Sakpata or Omolu. Um, so, and he's also governs pandemics, epidemics. Um, he utilizes epidemics to punish um, disorder and its purveyors. You very often in West Afuraka, Afuraka, he uses smallpox as a pandemic to wage war against the enemy. And just like he does that, uh, Sekhmet who was the wife of um, Ptah, she also uses pandemics or epidemics to wage war against the enemy. So when there are major pandemics and it, you know, it has to deal with us, for example, there's a story about Ptah and the Battle of Pelusium when the Assyrians had invaded Kemet and the priests of Ptah went to Ptah for, you know, direction and they say that Ptah sent um, an army of rodents to attack the shields at night, to attack the shields of the Assyrians um, during the night when they woke up, their shields were attacked, they didn't have any defense, and the army routed the Assyrians to you know, win the battle and they honored Ptah for that. Now, in one sense that's talking about 
pandemics. Um, the rats are the carriers of the plague. So when they talk about the rat, Ptah sending rats um, to attack the shields of the Assyrians, they're talking about the carrier of the plague attacking the immunity of the Assyrians. They were given the plague, it devastated them, and we use that as a weapon of warfare. That has happened back then. Um, that's not, uh, during the so-called plague of Justinian. It wiped out a large percentage of the population right after Justinian ordered that the temples of ancient Kemet be shut down when the Romans had taken over control. They were in control of a certain northern parts of Kemet for a couple of centuries, but in southern Kemet and in Nubia, they weren't in control. But when they ordered the last temple of Aset to be shut down, then very soon after that, they got hit with the plague of Justinian and it wiped out a large percentage of the Europeans and they didn't recover from that until hundreds of years later. And that, you know, when they talk about the Europeans going into the Dark Ages for 500 years, um, a lot of that had to do with that plague wiping them out. A few hundred years later, they began to, you know, develop in Europe, start getting their bearings back a little bit. They started expanding to a certain extent, trying to exercise their influence, but they really didn't have any control because they had been dominated by black people in Spain and Portugal. Some of the people would later be called uh, Moors by the black, by the whites and their offspring. Of course, we didn't use that terminology. That's a term that they use to label us. And of course, we have an article, Moor means dead. And we go into detail about where that terminology comes from and why it was used as a pejorative title for black and a pejorative against us. And that's just the title we ended up, some of our people began to use just like it's no different than saying Negro, um, meaning dead as well, connected with um, like necrophilia and necromancy and so forth. So, but some of those people who were later um, designated Moors, they were controlling certain parts of Europe. Europeans weren't really controlling anything outside of Europe, but they started to expand a little bit. And then they got hit with the plague again, which they called the Black Death or the bubonic plague. And it, within five years, in the so-called 1300s, within five years, the plague wiped out what they call the Black Death, wiped out between one-third and one-half of the entire population of Europe. So again, this is Pota, this is Obaluae, Oboade, utilizing you know, epidemics to wipe out the enemy. And they didn't recover from that until a few hundred years later, and then they started trying to expand again. So the major plagues, like the Plague of Justinian, happened around what they would call the 6th century. About 700 years later, uh, Europeans started expanding a little bit. They got hit with the Black Death. It wiped them out. And 700 years after that is today, because that was about 700 years ago. So it's, you know, we're, this is time right for another plague from Obuade, from from uh, Sakpata. So we just go through that just to show that just like in the Yoruba tradition, in the Akan tradition, in ancient Kemet, he governs plays and Sekhmet um, as well. In fact, Sekhmet or Sakmata is connected to Sakpata as one of the Sakpata twins, Pata and Sekhmet. All right, any questions on that so far? Okay, let me get a drink of water right quick. Okay, so <clears throat> we're talking about the Shabaka text before we got into the Battle of Pelusium and how Pata um, basically saved the country through pandemics. But in that Shabaka text, it talks about the function, and they just call this Shabaka text because of, he was the one who found it and had it restored. But they talk about the functions of Pata. And we talked about the cosmological functions in the beginning. So they just go into some detail. So it's a couple of major sections. One section talks about how he um, fashions and how he creates. He's a functionary of the Supreme Being, but how he does that through talking about the heart and the tongue. And the, everything is generated within the heart, um, the desires in the heart for certain things to take place and take shape. And then the tongue speaks those things into action. So they will talk about Heru, 
operating through the heart, and then atem operating through the tongue. So that means a couple of things. On one hand, it means you know you have desires within your heart to have a certain thing take place. But you may you may want to um, have a certain organization, um, create a certain thing, whatever. You have that desire that's rooted in the heart. The brain directs what's happening in the heart. You have that desire, and then you speak those things into existence. Now, I meaning you speak the plans, you develop, you convey the information so that things can uh, eventually take shape. Um, that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is when they talk about the heart and they talk about heru, and then they talk about atem being the tongue, and then they say the teeth and the lips are the pasjetu, or the, what they call the ineid, or the, the di- that company of divinities that are connected to Atem. So in the cosmology of Anu, when we're talking about Odomankuma or Atem, and uh, Asaset Nebepet, and when they unite and give birth to Shu and Tafnu, the expansion and contraction, um, Shu and Tafnu give birth to Geb and Nut, which is the earth and the sky, and then Geb and Nut give birth to Asar, Aset, Set, and Nebethet. And those divinities make up that postjetu or postjet of um, ancient Anu, which is a creative company of Abosom who have their own functions. They often called them the Ennead because it was nine divinities typically spoken of. So they'll say the teeth, when you're reading the text or translations, they'll say the heart is connected to Heru and the tongue is connected to Atem, and then the Ennead of Atem, the deities that support Atem, are the teeth and the lips. So in the brain you have Pata, and he wants to fashion things, so in his heart he has the desire, and then he directs his tongue to speak it into existence. In the heart, or in this heart region, the second aspect of it is where the air comes up from, from the lungs, of course, the heart, the vibrations coming up. The tongue regulates the flow of the air that's coming through the trachea. So when you're speaking sounds and coming through the voice box, once those vibrations come out through the throat region, the tongue, the movements of the tongue, whether you put the tongue on the tip of the roof of the mouth and create certain vibrations, um, wherever you move the tongue, it regulates the flow and it changes the nature of just a surge of air coming up or a surge of vibrations. The tongue changes the quality, regulates the flow, and changes the nature of the vibrations. And then the teeth and the lips, which are the servants of Atem, when they say the teeth and the lips are the Ennead of Atem, of the tongue, then the teeth and lips um, further give nuance to the sound. So the way you um, position your teeth and your lips, when you're speaking a sound, first it comes from the heart region, comes through the tongue, the tongue regulates the flow of the vibrations and the airflow, that changes the nature of the sound and tweaks it, and then the teeth and the lips are the fine, final um, nuance that gives specific form to the sounds. So it's talking about vibratory frequencies on one hand that are released and come out of the human body and different vibratory forms have different effects. Different sound vibrations have different effects on people as well as on matter. We know that sound vibrations are powerful. You can, somebody can sing and you, they can hear the sound vibrations and they can actually break a glass just with sound vibrations. So we know those vibrations are powerful. Different sounds, whether they're shrill sounds or deep, um, you know, slow moving vibrations. Different vibrations have different effects upon matter, but also on organs, the human organs, the human body, and then on the brain and our perception. So we have a catalog of all the sounds, all the energies that they elicit and they affect, and we've cataloged that over thousands of years and we know the differences. That comes from Pata. So when Pata thinks about a certain, you know, decides to fashion a certain planet, sun, moon, star, um, land mass, and so forth, mountain, um, river bank, uh, whatever it is, atmosphere, getting that information directly from Amen, Amenet, 
fashioning it accordingly. It utilizes sound vibrations um, directed through the desire of the heart, um, reverberating with the tongue, connected with our tim, and then the teeth and the lips further you know, nuance that sound and give birth to a certain frequency of energy that will affect matter in a certain way. So that, that's talking about the first part of the text dealing with Pata. Then you have the second part of the text talking about Pata, since he's the force in nature that fashions matter, unformed matter like the black substance of space into specific forms, they talk about Pata's functioning. So they will say, Pata, he gave birth to the Abosom, he gave birth to the goddesses and gods. Talking about on earth. Now in the spirit realm, Ra and Rayet give birth to all of the Ba's, or the living spirits, of all of the deities. And their energy, they're like miniature Ra and Rayets. Just like you have a spirit, a living energy, coursing through your body, and when you die, your spirit leaves your body and flies away like a bird. And that's why they show the Ba, the divine living spirit that's in your body, in the form of a bird that dwells within you and flies away when you die. Uh, make your transition. All the divinities have Ba's. The divinities that operate through the uh, planets, through the suns, through the moons. Um, all of them have Ba's that are created by Ra and Ra'et. So, they have those forms, but uh, Pata has to fashion a planet. For example, every Abosom has a Ka. So if Amen and Amenet direct a certain spirit to animate a certain planet, then Pata has to fashion the planet, and now the spirit can enter that planet and execute its function. If a certain spirit is supposed to come into the world to carry out a fiery function, Pata has to fashion the star fashion the sun and now the spirit can enter that that body and animate that body and project that energy as it was directed to by Inyame wa Inyame. If a certain spirit is to operate and bring a cool energy into the universe, that's its function given to that spirit, that deity by Inyame wa Inyame. But then Bata first has to fashion a form that that spirit can invest itself into in order to carry out that function. So in the text, it talks about that. So the first part when it says, he gave birth to all of the gods and goddesses, or the Abosom, what it's talking about is, in the universe, after Ra and Ra'et comes out of the darkness of space and creates these black spheres, now Pataz invested in these black spheres at the innermost core of the black sphere that will become the sun, the innermost core of the black sphere that will become the earth mother the innermost core of the black spheres that we become the other suns, planets, moons, stars, and so forth. And as he's working in the innermost core, he's shaping them and fashioning them into whatever Amen and Aminet direct him to fashion them into. At the innermost core of the sun, he fashions an orb that's a fiery orb. Then Ra and Ra'et and other solar abosom now can invest themselves in that solar orb. In our planet, when it's separated initially from the Aten, from our sun, and it was a sphere, Pataj was sent into the innermost core of that sphere and began to expand and contract with Sekhmet to shape that particular sphere into a particular form according to what Nyame wa Nyame directed Pata or Oboide to fashion it into, and what it was directed to, what he was directed to do was fashion it in the form that it is now, which is uh, 70 plus percent water, mountains, riverbanks, um, atmosphere, all these forms. And now that he fashioned these forms, these specific forms, from the center, from the core, now the spirits of the Abosom can enter into those forms. The ones that were supposed to be watery divinities, they can enter into the ocean. The ones that were supposed to be um, divinities of the wind, their spirits can enter the atmosphere. Those who are supposed to be Abosom who operate through mountainous regions, now their spirits can enter the mountainous regions because Pata, one of these great creative Abosom, uh, did his work and now they can enter into the, in, into the forms that he's fashioned. Pata, as well as Sekhmet, 
and Tridrion Pong and Atem Odomankoma. These are major Abosong who then ha have children as well. So you have Amen and Amenet, Hehu and Hehut, Kain, uh, Kain Kayet, Hehu and Hehut, Nun and Nunet. Those are primordial Abosom, Amen and Amenet at the top. Then you have Ra and Ra'et who comes out of the darkness and begins to shape and move and expand and separate the blackness. And then you have Ptah and you have Atem and you have Kepra and um, Asase Afwe, Asase Ya, and so forth. And that's that next level of creative Abosom. And then they have children as well. And those are the children that who end up moving into Abosom of rivers, Abosom of mountains, Abosom of the atmosphere, and so forth. So, and we've spoken about some of those before. So when they talk about Bata giving birth to the gods and goddesses, they're talking about him fashioning the forms first so that they can go and enter into those forms. So they say he gave birth to the Abosom. He, he fashioned or made the towns, the cities. He fashioned or made the gnomes, the Hesepu, or the villages. Um, he established or he, he directed the shrines of the Abosom. So the Abosom, after he fashioned the towns, certain regions of the planet that carry a certain kind of energy. So he fashioned mountainous regions fashion desert regions, fashion different regions. Now these become shrine places or regions that certain divinities of certain energy complexes can enter into. They can execute their function now because they have a place to operate through. So he gave them a place to operate through and they entered into those regions. Then they say he settled their offerings. What are their offerings? What are their ritual offerings that we will be giving them to harmonize with them? He established and settled those. Then he established their shrines, their shrine places in these different regions. So if they're in a desert region, what is a natural shrine in the desert region for that Abosom that we can go to? If they're in a forest region, what is a natural shrine near a cave or near a river or whatever? What's a natural shrine that carries the energy of that Abosom that we can go to? So he established their shrines. And then he established, it says, the text says, he established their bodies according to their wishes. And all that means is, just like we have a kra, or krawa, we have a ka and kayet, we have a specific function to execute in creation. The abosom also have an inkra and inkrabi, a specific function to execute in creation. So the fiery abosom, they have a certain function to execute in creation. The watery abosom, they have a certain function to execute in creation. Their desire, of course, and these are English translations when they say according to their desires. Basically what it's saying is, according to what their function is, Ptah fashions different parts of the world according to their function that's given to them by Inyame wa Inyame so that they can um, operate through those specific uh, parts of the world. So when, they, he says, when, they, when the text says he fashioned their bodies into specific forms according to their desires. First he established the cities and the regions, the gnomes, the different parts of earth, then the gnomes, the different villages, and you know the shrines in those natural areas. So you have natural shrines, like certain caves are natural shrines for an abosom. Certain um, places along a river bank are natural shrines for that abosom. Certain places up under the sun where it's hitting very hard and you can feel the, the heat are a certain shrine for that abosom. So he, he established nature shrines for those abosom for them to operate through. Now you get to the part of the text where it says he established and fashioned their bodies according to their desires. Now they're talking about actual ritual pieces according to their desires. So when we're talking about sculptures of the deities sculptures of the Abosom, sculptures of the, you know, um, Orisha, the Vodou, the Ntoru, Ntoru Tu. They are fashioned according to a specific form given by Inyame wa Inyame and conveyed by the Abosom. When we fashion images of Heru, images of Het Heru, images of Ra, images of Ra'et, images of any Abosom, it's not just 
an artistic um, rendition of what we think they should dwell in. We communicate with the Abosone. They direct us on how to fashion those images, how to establish their particular shrines, how to establish their temples, how they should be set up, how they should be oriented. Should they be oriented towards the summer solstice, um, this winter solstice, the equinoxes, certain star constellations, whatever it is, we get that information directly from them because it's, it becomes optimal. It's the best way to communicate with them. They know that. So we listen to them or they possess and tell the community through possession, uh, create this shrine this way, create this particular temple in this fashion. And then we follow, you know, and do that. The first incidence of the Abosom communicating how they want their natural shrine set up is conveyed in the text where they say, Pata fashion their bodies uh, according to their desires, talking about their specific um, ritual implements, whether it was shrines, temples, and so forth. And then the text says that the Abosom, the deities, entered into their bodies um, of every kind of wood, every kind of clay, every kind of stone, and all the regions upon which they dwelt. Now, when they talk about that, they're talking about Pata in the form of Pata Tanen or Pata Ta Tanen. Ta means land and Tanen mean, means inert. So the inert land, the primordial land before the, you know, the divine hill, the first inert land that was the first part of the earth when it was the molten core was generating, um, you know, fashioning the surface of earth, that was that inert land. And eventually it developed into a, a plain. Now, of course, we talk about the Khan Kaet that rose up out of the, you know, the primordial ocean. That was the first Ka and Kaet. And since Bata was at the core of earth, he was fashioning that Ka and caused it to surge upward. But then you know, you have plains, you have flatlands as well when the water begins to recede. And then when the crops and everything grow up out of these flatlands, um, river banks are created and so forth. Certain, when it, the text talks about they entered into th their bodies that Ptah fashioned of every kind of wood, every kind of stone, every kind of clay, every form that he um, existed, every form that existed upon him, they're talking about when he's operating through the ta, the flat land, which is part of pota. That second part is related to ta and ta tanin, meaning the flat land, the plain, and all the different formations. They're talking about geology. So they entered into these forms, and now you have not only an earth, an asase, but you have different regions of earth. You have the abosom, who are now active operating through the different regions of earth now you have a vibrant planet connected with divinities and then when we go to these different sacred regions we can communicate with the abosom through these different regions okay so uh any questions on that so far let's see okay let me get some water right quick Okay, let me, um, let me, give me one second. I just want to check something to make sure. I want to pull up, um, now we posted the Shabaka text inside of the, um, in the events section on the, um, I can some on the invite. We posted the whole, the entire text. So you can check that out. And we also posted some links to the different articles that we've, where we talked about Pata to a certain extent. I just wanted to make sure we hit the points that we were trying to hit. We didn't miss out on anything that some people had asked about previously. Okay. Okay. All right. So, any questions on the information about Pata? Okay. So, and the last piece about Pata is just when it talks about um, after the Abosom entered into these different, you know, sh natural shrines, 
in the world for Ptah, and then when Ptah also fashioned shrines, for example, temples, um, sculptures, and so forth. That's why he's the master craftsman, crafting sculptures, um, architect. He creates the universe, universal forms in the universe, planets, suns, moons, and stars, and so forth. He also fashions our physical bodies, plant life, animal life, mineral life, afurakani, afurakani, human life, and then he also fashions those ritual forms, not just the cities, ritual regions of the world, but then the different regions of those cities, and then within those regions, certain temples or shrine spaces that are sacred, and then within those shrine spaces, certain sculptures, altars, ritual implements, and so forth. He's fashioning on every level, um, you know, universal, earthly, you know, regional, um, temple, and then also implements. And then the Abosom enter into those various regions that resonate according to their frequency and according to their Nkra and Krabia. And now we have a vibrant, um, a vibrant form, a vibrant earth, a vibrant region, sacred lands, and so forth. And then he says, then the texts say that he's connected to all of the Abosom and all of their Ka's. He functions in the world as the great Ka and Kayat function in the universe. So sometimes he takes on that title, Ka. Now he also has other titles. Um, one of his major titles is Pata Neb Ankh. Neb means master, master, and of course Ankh means life. So Pata as the divine fashioner of the divine living energy that's operating through all created entities, he is the master of Ankh or the master of life, the life force energy. Now why would he be the master of life? Because of course he's taking this life force that's expansive and fashioning it into specific forms that carry the potency to execute specific objectives or carry the potency to shape your thoughts in a certain form that compel you to move in according with your divine function. As opposed to you just doing whatever you want to do, you're moving in accordance with your divine function because, because of the operation of Pata. So he's mastering not just living, but he's mastering Ankh, the life force energy that courses throughout all created entities. Now, Pata's name has been corrupted. Now we have different uh, pronunciations of Pata, like Pata became Porta, Boada, Boade, and Oboade in Akan. Same Abosom, same function. The whites and their offspring corrupted Pata into Puta, Buddha, and Buddha. And they made, created this false entity, a white character named, that they named Buddha, took the descriptive title of Pata and the functions of Pata added them to this fictional white character and then manufactured a false philosophy based on corrupted fragments of our cosmology. They wanted you to believe and us to believe that the whites and their offspring are capable of what they would consider divine enlightenment, which of course they're incapable of. In fact, the whole notion of enlightenment, they don't even understand that that concept, the way they teach that, is, is foolish in and of itself. So, and of course there was no black Buddha either. The character did not exist. But Ta is a force in nature operating right now at the innermost core of the sun, the innermost core of earth, and with respect to Afurakanu, Afuraikaitnu, but Ta is operating through the formative power of our spirit whose shrine is in the brain. So, He's a force in nature. It's Obaluae, Obuade, Sakpata, and so forth. So that's who he is. There was never a person walking around named Buddha uh, 2,500 years ago in India teaching anybody anything. That's totally inaccurate. And they say Buddha was the son, you know, born of a virgin, Mahamaya, or the great Maya. That's just a corruption of the um, story of the Heru. Maia is a corruption of Maia or Maria or Mari, which comes from Merit, which is a title of our set, meaning beloved, and Merit, of course, also is Mary, in the Mary and Jesus foolishness. So 
that that aspect is taken directly from Asara Sed and Heru. Pata being the um, or Buddha, the fictional character Buddha being the sage or the life master that comes from Pata Neb Ankh, Pata the master of life or the life master Neb Ankh. So of course they're going to say Buddha is the life master or the sage, sage meaning life master. Of course sage is a title that's a corruption of Sesha from ancient Kemet. Sesha means um, learned one, wise one, and so forth, and is attributed to Pata and other Abosom. So the term sage comes from Sesha, meaning learned one, a wise one. They attach that title to the fictional character Buddha. Um, they call him the life master because it comes from Pata's functioning as life master, Pata Nebam. Now, all that information surrounding Pata, what his function is, why he is the force on the masculine side, just like Sekhmet is the force on the feminine side, that fashions the divine living energy of Ra and Rayat in the universe into specific um, units of power that can execute specific objectives. And since he's the one that does that, he's mastering, constantly fashioning and mastering the life force, sculpting, crafting the life force into potent matrices to compel certain movements and developments in the universe. When they talk about Buddha being a life master because he can control his uh, thoughts and emotions, that's a total gutting of who Pata actually is. It's, it's pure foolishness. It has nothing to do with reality. The notion of enlightenment, the whites and their offspring got from a title of the ancestresses and ancestors in ancient Kemet, when we call the honored ancestresses and ancestors, the spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors, whose Ba and Ka, spirit and soul, were united harmoniously after death, they would be called Aku. And the Medut for Aku is the crested Habui, or the crested so-called ibis or crane, but then often they will show uh, medut, uh, determinative medut of the symbol for the sun, and these people we call shining, illuminated ones associated with the stars, but those who illuminate the darkness um, awaken people from blindness. There's a difference between darkness and blindness. Darkness is the black substance of space, that's divinity, that's divine consciousness, that's the source of everything, including light. So it's not that light is superior. Darkness is divine. Blindness is a perversion. So if someone is blind, that's because a defect or, or injury has occurred. That's unnatural, that's out of order, that's perverse. So, and somebody who's illuminated like a star, trying to, you know, giving light to somebody who, who can navigate their way through um, life, that's one of the reasons that the ancestresses and ancestors were called Aku. They were illuminating the darkness. Their spirits were connected to the stars in the sky, not because they were, it has nothing to do with extraterrestrialism or some, any foolishness like that. It has to do with an association with the Duat, which is when somebody dies, they go through that dark um, channel to make it from this world to the ancestral realm. And on Earth, that channel is lit by the star system coming from the Milky Way, the Hop Or, or the Great Hopi in the sky, the Great Heavenly Nile. So the ancestors and ancestors were associated with illumination in that sense, so we, they could guide us on our path to the ancestral realm to live in harmony with the other Nananum and Samafu, or ancestresses and ancestors who are cultivated. So that whole notion of an ancestral spirit being called Aku, meaning a shining one, they took that information and associated with uh, divine illumination or enlightenment, or trying to escape the cycle of reincarnation. That's idiotic. The whites and their offspring don't have a Ba, they don't have a Ka, they don't have a Bra, they don't have Kra. So they have no connection, no conscious connection, no connection at all to the great Ka and Ka, the divine consciousness, so they are spirits of disorder. That's how they incarnate. 
There's nothing that they can do to become quote unquote enlightened or to become an Aku or an Akut, one of the divine ancestral spirits because you must have a Ka in order to move in that direction. They, if you don't have a Ka, then you don't have a function. And if you don't have a function, you're no different than a uh, cancerous cell in the body that has degenerated into a cell that's now trying to consume all the other cells. It has no function. The Supreme Being didn't create the cancerous cell and place it in the body to destroy the body. It created normal, healthy cells. And when the healthy cells, some of them become, start moving in a perverse direction, now it left the divine order that was established by Inyame wa Inyame, and now it's eligible for destruction and um, repulsion. And of course, we always say, whites and their offspring, the Achiwaje folks, the spirits of disorder, are nothing more than cancerous cells in the body of black humanity. So they have no connection to the Ka. They don't have a Ka. They don't have a Ba. Therefore, they're not connected to Inyame wa Inyame. They're just cancerous, wayward cells. So it's impossible for them to even connect with anything that has to do with so-called enlightenment, even though they don't even understand what that concept is. So all those associations with Buddha are corruptions of a much deeper cosmology associated with the Abosom Pata. That also includes the terminology, we, we mentioned this in the Kuku Tuntun, Nuk Panuk, which means Nuk means I am, Pom means this, and Nuk again, so it means Nuk, Pom means I am this, I am, and then usually it's followed by something else. Like they would say, Nuk Panuk Pata, I am this, I am Pata or I am this, I am Sekhmet, or I am this, and so forth. The Achiwadifo contracted that from Nukpanu to Nupanu, Nubanu, Nibanu, Nibana, as they say in Tibet, and Nirvana, as they say in, in Hinduism, and just took the whole meaning out of context. Nukpanu, establishing your identity, that's connected with Pata. You're given a specific function to execute in the world by Inyame wa Inyame. It's placed in your ka, placed in your divine consciousness. Now, Pata fashions you according to the dictates of Inyame wa Inyame that's encoded in your consciousness. He gives you a specific form that allows you to execute the function that was placed in your ka. That determines your reality, the realness and genuineness of who you are. It defines who you are. Pata gives form and face to actually who you are. It's in your crowd when you come from the spirit realm, but Pata fashions physical forms. First he fashions the spirit form, the spirit body, and then he fashions the physical form that reflects what's inside of your crowd, what's encoded in your crowd, what you are to, how you are to execute your function in the world. That determines your genuine nature. Pata gives face to that. So when it says, I am this, I am Pata, I am this, when you're declaring who you are, you can only do that through the agency of Pata having fashioned you properly. If you were given a false form or given some, if you, you know, one of the whites in their offspring, a melanin recessive spirit of disorder, that's not a natural form. Pata had nothing to do with that. A cancerous cell becoming disfigured was not fashioned by Pata. Uh, crack cocaine is not fashioned by Pata. Natural plant life, like the coca plant, is fashioned by Pata. If that's taken out of its natural state and um, gone, taken through a perverse process and a new product is created that never existed on Earth, that's not a creation of Pata. It's not a creation that was inspired by Inyame wa Inyame. It's a degeneration or a degradation of something that's natural. So it's an entity that exists, but it wasn't created. So it's not a genuine entity. When we're fashioned according to what's in our cry, then we're fashioned and given our genuine nature and Pata gives face to that. So now that determines and shows people the reality of who you are. Nupanu being corrupted to Nupanu and Nibanu and Nibbana and Nirvana and talking about you know, defining that as the state that you need to ascend to, that's pure foolishness. When the whites and offspring die, their spirits leave their bodies, 
many of them become earthbound or in a lower level of the spirit realm and until they reincarnate right back into their families. They never get drawn to Inyame wa Inyame to receive a Kra, to receive an Inkrabia, um, Inkra, She or Shebia, or any of that. They just go from this world to earthbound or lower level of the spirit realm where other perverse spirits are and then they reincarnate right back into their family lineages. They can spend years talking about enlightenment and escaping the cycle of reincarnation and the reality is they're right back here. And the idiocy of us trying to follow that kind of doctrine, it, it has no basis in reality. When you know you have a cry, you have a specific function. Since the whites and their offspring don't have a function, they're constantly trying to escape the world. They're trying to escape their bodies because they know their bodies are perverse and inferior. They're trying to escape the world because they don't have a function in the world. So they create chaos in the world, disorder in the world, and then they try to escape the world. We are not involved in escapism. We, we don't have a problem with the world because the world is sacred. We just talked about how Patah fashioned the world, fashioned the cosmos, fashioned the different towns, fashioned the villages, fashioned the shrines in the villages, fashioned the forms of uh, ritual implements so that the Yabosom entered the sacred regions of the earth, they entered the villages, they entered the towns, they entered the shrine implements, they entered different aspects of every level of creation. It's a sacred world and we were created and placed in this world as well by Ptah. So we don't have a problem with the world. The world isn't evil, the flesh isn't evil, any of that foolishness. That it has nothing to do with us. That has to do with them. Now their flesh is disordered and evil. The kind of world that they fashion is perverse. So they're trying to escape their world as well as infect our world while we're here. But that has no, no bearing on reality on how we should be functioning at all. So we just go into that and we also talk about that in um, the Cuckoo Tum Tum. So let me put that link up there for you. Going into detail about the fact that Pata was corrupted from uh, Buddha was corrupted from Pata. Okay, so you just go to the Kukutuntum page and you can download uh, we also we always suggest that you download the MP3 files so you can listen, you can hear them. We also have the text, the uh, transcript of the of the three CD. It was originally a three CD set. There are 13 tracks. They're all free downloads you can listen to. And then we have the actual transcript, um, a PDF file that you can download the book and read the book as well. And that not only talks about Pata, it also talks about the cosmology we talked about in the beginning. We also go into detail about just Afurakani, Afurakani cosmology, ancestral religion. And we also show that uh, Pata, well, it was corrupted into Buddha, but we also show the origins of the fictional characters, Abraham, Isaac, Ishmael, uh, Moses, Aaron, Solomon, Sheba, Menelik, Jesus, Muhammad, Allah, Yahweh, um, Brahman, and these various fictional characters, none of whom existed of any race whatsoever. So we go into detail about that. Okay, so... Um, Now, I saw a couple of questions. And if you have any questions, just um, post them. Okay, the sister said, I take pictures of the stars at night and there are faces in them of a people. Okay, what does that mean when you see faces in the stars? Now, you say, if you're taking pictures of the stars, I mean, you're taking pictures of distant. When you say faces, how do you mean? I mean, I mean, are you you're talking about in the constellations, around inside the constellations? Is that what you're saying? Just let me give me an idea of what you're, what kind of images you're seeing when you when you say you're taking pictures of the stars. And are you talking about take? You mean are you taking pictures like with a camera? Um, and once you you know see the images or the images come out you can see a face or something like that 
And if it is, there's a couple of things like with pictures, whether they're pictures from a camera or, you know, just pictures that are drawn or different images that are somebody pours libation on the ground and it becomes an image. Once you create an image, and this goes, deals directly with Pata, it can deal pr directly with Pata. If holistically, Pata is the one that creates, again, creates, okay, you said yes inside, okay. So Pata, remember, he, when you're looking at that text, he fashions the forms, um, the bodies of the Abosom according to their desires. That's in the Shabaka text. And then once he fashions their bodies, then the Abosom enter into those bodies of every wood, every clay, every stone, every part of the earth upon, you know, Patatanin, um, and, you know, into those different regions. So whether we create sculptures, sculptures created by Pata, or if a person is, you know, creating those sculptures under the direction of the Abosom Pata, then those forms will be proper forms. They will resonate at the frequency of the Abosom or a certain Nsumafo, and those spirits will enter and utilize those sculptures as idols. Idol idolatry is a divine, sacred uh, practice. That's the reason the whites and their offspring demonize it, because we can create an idol under the guidance of Pata, fashion that specific form according to the quote unquote wishes or directions of the Abosom, like an Abosom like Bena or Abena. And once we create that specific sculpture or a painting or a drawing, then the Abosom will move through it. Even if you can't draw very well at all, if you just listen to your Insomafo and the Abosom and draw that picture according to, you know, the best you can according to their direction, then they will operate through that form and communicate with you through that form. Just like we talked about before, like a cell phone. You know, you have a cell phone, if you have service, then you can use that as an instrument to communicate with somebody else. Sculptures, ritual sculptures, idols, Nseso and Akan are like those cell phones. They are sacred um, implements, tools that are used, communicative devices. When we listen to the Abosom and fashion them according to the specifications laid out by the Abosom, then the Abosom will enter those forms and use them to communicate with us directly. So instead of just being a spirit communicating with us, we're spirits operating through a physical body. So when we establish a form, whether it's a shrine or a sculpture or a drawing, now we have a physical form and the spirits can enter that form and now it's a spirit operating through a physical body communicating with us, which is a spirit operating through a physical body and now there's a full communication. And so, you know, Pata is behind that ultimately. So when you draw a picture or you take a picture or a painting, sometimes your abosom, if it's a properly structured, you know, um, picture or painting or drawing or whatever, will come through and communicate with you through that. Um, sometimes one of them, Samafo, will do that. Sometimes people will create pictures, drawings or whatever that are not harmonious and they will have discarnate spirits communicate with them through those pictures. Sometimes you hear about, you know, some of these foolish pictures of the Virgin Mary and that kind of foolishness. Sometimes that's, you know, people just playing games. Sometimes they have a discarnate spirit utilizing these little images to make people get hysterical. Of course, Mary didn't exist. So any spirit that the whites and the offspring are dealing with are always spirits of disorder. No spirits of order ever deal with the whites and their offspring. They repel the whites and their offspring and are repulsive to and repelled by the whites and their offspring. So, you know, that can happen as well and that can happen with us as well. If we're listening to discarnate spirits that are not, don't have our best interests at heart, or if we just have some discarnate relatives who may have not been malicious, but they're just trying to communicate with us and we're receptive and they know we're receptive and they know we're the only person in the family who is receptive because everybody else is going to church or not doing anything or drugging themselves with alcohol and stuff like that and they're not paying attention when then some will try to communicate with them while they're awake or even when they're asleep 
then the person in the family that's receptive, they'll try to communicate with them. Earthbound spirits will try to communicate with you and try to get your attention. And sometimes it can be through a, it can be in a mirror, it could be through a painting, it could be through a drawing, it can be through a television, whether the television is on or whether the television is off. They make lights flicker, a number of different things that they can do and will do to try to get your attention. So it's always important, that's another reason, one, one of many reasons why it's important to um, develop a relationship with your kra, your krawa, your ka, your kaet, but also establishing an nkombre, an nsama nkombre for your nanano nsamanfo. So you can develop a strong relationship with them, so you get direction from them, but then you also repel those um, spirits that you don't need influence from, and it's no different than you you know, eating right and getting enough sleep and doing some exercise so you can uh, easily repel the kind of bacteria that, that might otherwise bombard you and cause you a problem. You just repel it without effort because you're, you know, you're uh, strengthening your immunity. When you connect with your insomnifo and with your kra, you strengthen to a normal level your spiritual immunity. So you repel entities that you, you don't really need to deal with and they don't have the capacity to influence you. So you just want to, you know, it's always a good uh, rule of thumb basically to establish a good relationship with your insomnifo, your nanano insomnifo, so you can know who you're dealing with, who needs to be repelled, um, who will be repelled, whether you're doing it or whether they're doing it, so you can get some good information. But um, it is possible, you know, you have to determine, you have to find out the images that you're seeing. It could be some of your insomnifo, it could be discarded spirits, it could be abosom. You have to find out, and the best way to find out is to dealing with your insomnifo directly on a consistent basis. It doesn't necessarily need to be every single day. Whatever, you know, schedule you set up with them, that's what's most important. All right, let's see. Okay. Um, okay, so you say you're going to send a send a message. Okay, so now another question that says, does that mean that all the chants such as Om, Mani, um, Padme Hum are ineffective and and you got another question about another chant. Okay, think about the chants in this way. Well, first of all, you hear about mantras in, you know, um, Hinduism and Buddhism and stuff like that. So they'll have mantras that they use as chants, and then some people will associate Hekau with mantras in ancient Kemet and say, well, we have mantras too. They're called Hekau and they're words of power. All right, so in reality, all of the words in Afurakani, Afurakaitani languages have mantric value. It's not just one or two or a group of words. The whole language is structured in, in such a way that it carries, every word carries mantric value. The whole language is sacred. So you have a difference between the tones, the ton tonal languages like in West Afuraka, Afuraikai, and ancient Kemet, ancient Kani, these tonal languages, different tones have different meanings. So in Akan, of course, and we mentioned this before, um, uh, Papa means father. That's the low tone going to a high tone. Papa is a term that they use for father. Papa, high tone to low tone means good. And Papa means to pat. So it's the same, the same syllables. Papa. Papa and pa pa, three different words. Well, same same, you know, syllables, the same you know uh, vowels, the same consonants, but based on the tones, three different meanings, the same vowels and same consonants. So the tone changes. Different frequencies, um, different higher pitch tones have a different effect on creation, on our bodies, on our spirits. Lower pitch tones have certain effects. 
So we've cataloged all that. We are connected to our ancestral languages because the specific configuration of vibrations that comprise the words in our languages resonate with our spirits, with our asunsum, um, resonate with our organs, resonate with our abatum, our melanin, resonate with what our whites and offspring will call the DNA, resonate with our abusi abosom and edge abosom, meaning our uh, matrilineal deities that inherited through our matrilineal or matriclan, patrilineal divinities inherited from our father's side or the patrilineal divinity. So, for example, one of the patrilineal abosom is Nana Afram in our Khan culture. And we mentioned this, in, this is detailed, I'm just giving a summary, but this is detailed in the Okra, Okra complex book that we just published two weeks ago. So, you, you can get details in that, but there's a patrilineal abosom, edge abosom called, or in Toro called Afram in our Khan culture. And then you have, say for example, somebody from the Matric Clan, the Asona Matric Clan. We use that example in the book. So the Abosom coming from the mother's side, the Abosom coming from the father's side that are connected to the person. Just like you have DNA from your mother, DNA from your father. When you're born, there's a mixture. There's Abosom that governs your mother's clan, Abosom that governs your father's clan. We're talking about Afurakani, Afurakani, mother and father. And when you're born, you're connected to both of those abosom. You have their DNA. Of course, you look like them. But those abosom that have been connected to their clans for millennia, you're connected to them as well. That energy surging through your body from the time of conception affects the manner in which your body is formed because Pata, again, he listens to Nyame wa Nyame and he fashions you according to the dictates of your Nkra and Nkravia that's given by Inyame wa Inyame. So your form resonates at the frequency and is, you know, harmonious with these two abosom that govern you. And your language derives from that because you're resonating at a certain frequency. Um, if you're using another language trying to invoke the abosom, if it's not an ancestral language of Afuraka, Afurai Kaet, it's is not doing anything. It's no different than just babbling. Now, if you have a you know a pure mind, a pure heart, and you're just trying to communicate with Yabosong or your Insamafo, they're not listening to that European language, whether it's Asian, whether it's Tibetan, Hindu, or whatever. Whatever you're saying in English, or whatever you're saying in you know some Asian language, or you know whatever other language you're using. They're not listening to any of that. That's, you could be saying anything and they're not paying attention to that. They're listening to you no different than they will listen to a person who is deaf. And in fact, in, for example, in Vodun, there are a certain group of royal um, ancestresses and ancestors, the Tohosu, who protect people who are deaf and have other, you know, um, you know birth, so-called birth defects. And they give them special attention because, because of the way they were born, they make sure that people in the society uh, do not you know, deal with them in a negative fashion. If people do, then the people are punished by these royal ancestresses and ancestors. So when somebody is born with a birth defect, they are considered children of the Tohosu, and they have a certain level of veneration that's higher than the average person. So, and it's very similar across the board in Afraka Afrakaai. Our Nananom and Samafo treat us like that because they know we were born, you know, culturally deaf and culturally blind. So we can't hear the language right away because we don't know the language. So the only language we speak, many of us, is English or Spanish or something like that or French. So the Samafo and the Abosom, they treat us as people who are deaf and just like a deaf person who can't speak. But if they go poor libation and they think they're thinking about the abosom and thinking about the unsamafo and what they want to do and how they want to harmonize, the abosom tune in to the images that they're generating, tune in to the desire that's coming from the heart. Remember the heart and the tongue, Heru and Atem. They're the images and the desires that are generated from the heart and manifest um, in the brain as, you know, forms, images, ideas 
that are in harmony with order, the Abosom and Insumapho respond to that. So even before you start speaking, you can, you know, be about to, somebody asks you what a certain person's name is, um, and sometimes you may not be able to recall the person's name at the moment and you're trying to remember the name, but the person's image is in your mind and how they operate and the kind of energy they have and everything is in your spirit. You already have that. You're just using English words to give verbiage and artificial label to the image of the person that you're talking about. And it's the same thing when you're about to, when you're engaged in, you know, activity. When you want to do something, you have questioning, questions about something, you need answers about something, you need to get healed for a certain thing, you're generating those images of yourself being healed or if you, you know, if you're sick and your stomach is hurting and you go to the Unsamanfo, they see you get up, they see you're in pain, they see you with your stomach hurting, with the stomach ache, they know you're going through something, when they see you get up and start walking toward the Nsama and Komra and you're thinking about how your stomach is hurting and you need some kind of medicine, you don't know what medicine to take, they know what you're going through, so when you sit down and begin to focus on them before you even open your mouth, it's already in your spirit what's happening, and they tune into that. So if you start speaking English, they disregard that because it's not, you know, doing anything anyway. So if you have a pure intention, they will attune to that pure intention and those thoughts, those matrices of energy that generate geometric forms that manifest as images, and they tune into that and heal you based on that and they communicate with you that way. They plant thoughts in your head as well as put people in front of you to give you the kind of medicine or direction that you need. Now, that's how they deal with us until we begin to learn the language and then when we speak the language, um, even just basic things, you know, using terms like Inyamewa, Inyame or Amenet and Amen. If you were in a dark, you know, if you were in a forest and you got lost and you heard somebody speaking a language that you understand, then you're going to start moving towards that language because you understand it. If you start speaking a language, um, a traditional language, you're going to draw those Nananoman Samafo and Unsamafo Pa that were speaking that language for hundreds of years or thousands of years closer to you because they recognize that, you know, that language, those vibrations are harmonious, they're magnetic, they draw us together just like when we hear people speaking the language which turns out to be our ancestral language. You may hear different Afurakani, Afurakani languages, but then when you hear the one that's actually yours, you'll be more drawn to that than any other one that you ever heard even though you like the other ones and the way they sound. So that's one thing. But then if you start speaking the language of the Achiwadifo and directing it towards the spirit world, then the kind of spirits that you would draw towards you are the kind of spirits that spoke that language and they're spirits of disorder anyway, they're leeches anyway, they're always looking for a host to latch on to, so um, you don't even want to repeat those vibrations because number one, they have no effect whatsoever on the spirit realm, they have no effect on your spiritual development, they only create disorder. Discordant vibrations are the only things that European languages, whether they're Asian, any kind of Eurasian, European, American, pseudo Native American or whatever, they create, you know, discordant energy patterns in the world and in your body and in your spirit and in your mind. And the Nsamafu and Abosom don't listen to that. So the only kind of spirits who listen to that are spirits of disorder. So now of course we have um, relatives who only spoke English. But again, you don't have to communicate in English. You can go pour libation sit down and, and listen, communicate through your thoughts, and they attune to that because they already see you getting ready to go to the shrine in the first place. So you don't have to use English to communicate with them. You can, in fact, you can use, once you start learning traditional language, you can use that and they began to draw, you know, connect with that because now that they're in Asamando in the spirit realm, they're already connecting with the Nananoma and Samafo that they had left behind when they were living on Earth. So even our grandparents and great-grandparents who never spoke any traditional language or knew nothing about the culture, when they made their transition and went to Asamando, now they're in communication and in the presence of the spirits of their ancient Nsamanfo, their ancient 
ancestresses and ancestors who were speaking the language and now they can communicate with them on a regular basis and learn language so when they see you sit down and pull libation and communicate in tree or Yoruba or Wolof or whatever they're learning that from their Ansamanfo, which is also our Ansamanfo, who are in the spirit realm right now. So, all that to say, no, you, do, you never use a language of the whites and their offspring because you just create disorder on one hand. It doesn't connect you to anything. The only thing that will happen is that some of those perverse spirits will start coming towards you. Sometimes people who are very receptive and don't have their spiritual immunity up will get assaulted or you know negatively affected by these spirits some people who have a little bit of spiritual immunity the only thing that will happen is those spirits will get to the head and they will you know constantly suggest these false doctrines so when you have people talking about enlightenment and monotheism and all races can come together and extraterrestrialism and lost landism like Mu and Lemuria and stuff like that or oh, smoking weed is spiritual and all that kind of foolishness a lot of those people they were trying to do the right thing but they're calling on perverse entities calling on so-called Greek gods and trying to blacken them up and foolishness like that and those spirits come right to them and they plant the same foolishness in their minds that the whites and their offspring are planting here on a regular basis and it corrupts their perception of what ancestral religion really is so you have all these Eurocentric corruptions that are parading around as the Kemetic tradition or the Yoruba tradition or whatever. So you don't want to using those using European languages are ineffective and destructive. So but as long as you have a pure heart, pure intention, you can go directly to your Samafo to sit down and listen. They will direct you. They'll give you information. You've probably they've probably already given you or shown you in a certain way what ancestral blood circle you actually come from. You've probably been drawn to one particular kind of sculpture or one artifact from one group you've seen online or something like that and didn't realize that that was the group you're from. But even if you haven't yet, um, then some alpha will give you that information and confirm it for you. Okay, uh, let's see. I okay, just want to make sure I got to everybody's comments. Okay, and I see some other messages. But it's no, you know, when we first start out dealing with ancestral religion, um, you know, we don't know anything. So, again, we're no different than. Um, just like in Vodun with the Tohosu, those royal ancestresses and ancestors who protect those who are of death. We have Nsamanfo who know what we have gone through and they protect us and give us some insight that sometimes, you know, people on the continent and other people who've been involved in the culture for a while don't even have yet because they've given us, you know, some protection. These Nsamanfo have seen what we've gone through, but at the same time, they see our pure intentions and they protect us from certain things as long as we align with them and they will feed us information so even you know you can start looking in um, text like if you don't know the traditional language or group you're from download some information and you can go on our website um, ojidafo.com but download information about translations of the language of Kemet and you can use prayers from the language of ancient Kemet because we're all connected to Kani and Kemet, Nubi and Kemet, all the groups on the continent are connected to them in some fashion. So you can use the language of Kemet and then your Ensemble would direct you to which group you're actually from. So it's, you know, it's not a problem. And it's okay to sometimes just sit down and listen without saying anything, just, you know, projecting your thoughts. Okay, so you said it's Ankh an actual chant. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't really have to be a chant per se. I mean, you you can chant Ankh just like we when we speak the language. For example, when we create ritual songs, 
all the ritual songs we were singing to our bosom or risha or whatever of course the songs are comprised of the words from the language we just use a certain kind of melody that's had a certain cadence um, that carries an energy you know of a certain uh, bosom some of the songs are cool some of them are fiery fast some of them are slower you know what I'm saying so but they're comprised of the words in the language so um, that's no different than a quote-unquote chant we're using the words of our language in a certain kind of way so you can use words if you but it doesn't have to be a chant per se it's not like okay I have to chant this over and over again and then this is going to open up a valve in my consciousness and so forth. It, it really doesn't work like that our abosom your insomafo are around you when you sit down and you're ready to communicate with them they're no different they are your grandparents they're your great grandparents they're your great great grandparents and grand aunts and grand uncles and so forth and just like if they were alive here and you gave them some food and sat down and listened to what they had to say you're doing the same thing when you establish an comre, whether it's an abosom comre for abosom deities or a saman comre for your insumanfo if it's your family members you sit down and communicate give them some food give them you know some drinks some pour some libation and and sit down and communicate you can sing some sometimes people do like singing the vibrations you know align you with the force in nature that you're trying to communicate with or creates a stronger bond or kind of like a gravitational pull that aligns people together um, you know when you sing or when you do some form of chant or ritual prayer but you can use any of those words in Kemet you can you can you know go pull down uh, a transliteration of the Pert M. Heru for example the so-called Egyptian Book of the Dead a transliteration so you can see the actual language and then you can use some of those prayers as the prayers you know to your Ensemble to the Abo song you can start off with that and your Ensemble will direct you towards what they want you to you know what language they want you to use and how they want you to communicate so you can just start off with that okay so one question was about providing some words or phrases that can be used in at the shrine in a prayer so I'm gonna give you the site Okay, so um, okay, so the Afuraka Afurakai dot ning dot com site is our network, our cultural network, similar to Facebook, but it's our own, you know, cultural network, and we have members on there, and people join. You, you know, establish your own page. There are forums, there are videos, there are, you know, um, you know, blogs and things like that. People are studying the same kind of information. So you can go to that site, you can join. It's, it's, it's a free sign up, of course. Afurakafurakai.ning.com. Um, and then one of the forum discussions is called Apae. So all you have to do is go into the, once you join, go into the search um, engine for the website and just type in Apae, which means prayers in Chui. And then there's a forum discussion. We were talking about this subject, and then we posted like a basic prayer with the language of ancient Kemet taken directly from you know the language itself taken directly from the text and we just composed a simple prayer to the supreme being the Abosom and the Ansamanfo as well as a simple prayer to the Ka the Kra and that anybody any one of our people Afurakani, Afurakani only of course can use when communicating with your Kra your Krawa, your Ka, your Kaya or Inu, say and communicating with your, you know, like a libation prayer to the Supreme Being, the, the Abo Som and the Nananoma Samafa. So you can just go there and type that in and, and it, you can pull up that discussion. And the whole prayer is laid out, a couple of them. Okay, so, um, all right, so if there's no other questions, we're going to, um, leave it right there and uh, let me make sure I didn't miss anybody 
Okay. So yeah, so we will um, we'll leave it right there. So we will post the next event, um, Evite, um, in both places. We'll post it on Akanfo Nana Song uh, on Facebook, but then we also post the same um, invite on afurakafrakai.ning.com site. So the next time we do a session, we typically do the sessions on Benada on Tuesdays. So just look out, look on either the Ning site or the um, our Facebook page. And the Facebook page is Afuraka Afrakai. Of course, the website is ojirafo.com. And I'm also posting Alright, the I just posted a link the uh the Enhoma page on the website. And on that page we just um two weeks ago we just published a book, it's an ebook, it's called the Okra Okra Complex, the Soul of Our Confo. Um, we talk about the nature and function of the Kra, the Krawa, the Ka and the Kayet um, in detail. It's, a PDF, it's in PDF format. We haven't published the hard copies yet. Um, we will do that in the near future. Right now it's just available as a um, full color e, you know, PDF book that you can download. It is a free download. We do have a Achebe or a donation button if you want to um, make a donation towards the, you know, we're trying to publish the hard copies as well as do other things and continue to, you know, uh, publish the various books that we have and have them out there on the websites for free. So if you want to make a donation towards that, it's right there. But, but the book is free. Um, it's only two weeks, only been out for two weeks, so a number of people have downloaded and people are studying right now. Um, the next session we might more than likely we might just go in detail on that book we might have to spend a couple of sessions going in detail for that so but we'll let you know uh, that decision what what we're going to do on the next presentation but more than likely it will be the okra okra complex book but you can go to that website download the book immediately and start studying that um, go to our regular ojirafo site we have about 12 books out over 40 articles um, then we also have our Ojidafo um, um, YouTube page and I'll put that out there for you okay all of the videos that we do um, for the Akanfo Nana Song are posted to the YouTube page they're also posted on this Ustream channel, but we also post them on the YouTube page as well, and we typically post them on the same night. So at some point later tonight, we'll post that video, but you can see all of them. We also have them on the um, afurakafrakai.ning.com site and the link to the regular OJ.fo site. So, all right, so medase, um, and we will be sending out our invitation for the next Akamfo Nanasong within the next uh, couple of days, so check us out. All right, mid -assay.